Hey guys, I want to share with you guys my experience with Gennato Relin and um, talk a little bit why I think that this is, unfortunately, this is going to be a poor substitute for HCG uh, when it comes to uh, therapy for men that are on TRT uh, in terms of like preserving fertility, testicular volume, uh, etc. On paper, Gennato Relin sounds like it's going to be awesome. So it works essentially one step up on the HPTA axis. Um, on paper, it should appropriately stimulate the pituitary gland to create LH and FSH, which is, as I'm sure you guys all know, um, then act on the testicle to um, stimulate both uh, sperm and testosterone production. So it sounds like a great thing, right? Just substitute some GnRH uh, analog in the form of gonadarellin and off you go. Well, unfortunately, that's that's not really the case. Um, and, and when I started seeing this stuff um, being promoted, you know, on the Internet and YouTube and places like that and by various clinics, I was immediately suspicious that I, I just, you know, knowing what I know about the mechanisms of how gonadarellin and GNRH and how the whole axis works, um, I, I just didn't see how it could possibly be uh, equivalent to HCG, uh, certainly in terms of like maintaining fertility um, and, uh, and and even testosterone levels. But you know, I was willing to give it a go, and uh, I put myself on one of the more standard protocols that I've seen out there. Since obviously uh, HCG now, you pretty much can't get it. Um, thanks FDA. Um, well, you can get it. You just have to get brand name. Uh, HCG, which is in short supply, and um, of course, it's extremely expensive. Uh, the FDA, if you're not aware, has clamped down on compounding pharmacies uh, manufacturing HCG for reasons that I don't want to get into right now because, um, well, I'll save that rant for another time. <laughs> Let's just say I don't think there are any legitimate medical reasons to not let compounding pharmacies make HCG, but we'll save that again for another time. So, the way GnRH works um, is above that, you have this K and DY network, which the K and the K and DY is all you really need to know about. Uh, that's the peptide kispeptin. So kispeptin, which is in the hypothalamus, stimulates other cells in the hypothalamus that make GnRH. And then GnRH is secreted mainly in two ways, but really only one that matters for men. Uh, and that way is in these little... Uh, it's in a pulsatile fashion. So you'll get these little bursts of GnRH coming from these cells, so, you know, sort of like Morse code. So every 20, 30 minutes, you get a little pulse. Okay. Now there is like a surge of GnRH that happens in women uh, related to their menstrual cycles, but that's kind of irrelevant for what we're talking about today. So these little pulses are then detected by the pituitary gland, which in turn makes its own little pulses of LH and FSH, mostly LH, but FSH as well. And then it's these continuous little pulses of LH and FSH, which uh, occur throughout the day, day and night, um, that uh, you know essentially provide a way to get a detectable LH or FSH level, like when you go in for blood work. There's, you know, if you're not on TRT um, and assuming you have a normal HPTA access, at, at any point during the day when you draw blood, you're going to have detectable detectable LH and, um, and FSH. So, um, it, you know, essentially that's what your body is used to is these little pulses. Um, and so... You know, going back to what I learned in medical school and then what I saw in, in clinical practice as a, as a family doc, um, you know, the only time I ever saw GnRH analogs used, uh, of which gonadarellin is, is a GnRH analog, was um, in order to chemically castrate men um, who had uh, hormone sensitive, uh, usually advanced uh, prostate cancer. and. What these analogs would do is, you know, the urologists um, would give these guys big doses of these GnRH analogs that were long acting. And so the body is used to having these little pulses. So the little pulses increase LH and FSH, which in turn increase testosterone. Well, in this case, what these guys want to do, they want to turn off 
the man's testosterone entirely. They want to chemically castrate him uh, in the hope that it can slow the spread of the prostate cancer. So constant GnRH stimulation does the exact opposite of what you would think it would do, right? You would think that it would cause constant LH and FSH secretion, and that's not the case. What happens is it completely turns it off, testosterone levels go to near zero, uh, and then hopefully the prostate cancer um, stops growing, which it usually does, um, at least for a little while, and then a lot of times, unfortunately, starts up again. So when I started seeing these protocols, which um, most of them uh, are typically like big doses, like 100 micrograms twice a week, sometimes three times a week, that kind of, you know, although it's not the same as the prostate cancer doses that, that are used in the oncology world and urology world, it it seems suspicious to me that that would be sufficient to create a sustained level of LH and FSH. And again, you need sustained LH, sustained FSH around the clock in order to maintain adequate spermatogenesis. Um, if you don't have that, you're just, you're just not going to have it. So, um, you know, unfortunately that's, that's just the way it goes. Um, so, um, I have been extremely uh, skeptical of gonadarellin, but you know, Hey, I, I thought I'd give it a try and get my labs done and yeah, see what happens. So what I did was I did 100 micrograms twice a week. I think I was doing like Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, I was probably off every now and then, but in general, it was twice a week. Uh, discontinued HCG uh, and maintained my normal weekly testosterone dose. Now, clinically, I felt completely the same. I, I, honestly, I didn't notice a difference. Uh, there are some people that just feel like miraculously better on HCG. Um, I don't know that I'm really one of those guys. Um, so it, it, I didn't notice a difference. Libido was good. Mood was good. Energy, cognitive function, all of the normal things that uh, men typically get on TRT f for uh, were good with me. So I felt great. Um, so uh, at least from that regard, like it, it didn't do any harm. Um, at least. So I wanted to be on that for at least a month uh, before I went and got my LH and FSH levels checked and I ended up going a little bit longer than that. I was like six weeks uh, to get through the vial that I got. And um, what I did was I ended up um, going to the lab about, it was roughly 24 hours after um, my last injection of gonadarellin. And again, I, I knew that I knew that the levels would look like they, like they would, like they did. Okay, I'm going to show you in here in just a second. Um, the half life of LH is very short; it's like 20 or 30 minutes. And so, um, even if I had gotten a, a boost or a burst of LH after my injection, it's going to be long gone 24 hours later. Um, but you know, again, this is what the protocol that these clinics are using, and I have seen some clinics online post results from patients. Um, that showed detectable levels of LH and FSH on a similar protocol. So I thought, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'm missing something here. Um, let, let's see what happens. Well, he, here's the results. So I'll put them up on the screen for you guys. Not surprisingly, LH and FSH undetectable, right? Less than 0 0.3, which is exactly what I, it's exactly what you would see on a man who uh, was on TRT, right? The um, pituitary gland is shut down. Hypothalamus, uh, obviously, as well. Um, now, these other labs here, I, I get these periodically. They're unrelated to what we're talking about today. Um, but uh, as an aside, uh, a high sensitivity or cardiac CRP is something I keep a close tab on, not only in myself, but in my patients. It's a marker of systemic inflammation. You want that low, well under one. And you see, I'm doing pretty good, right? 0.19. I'm happy with that. And then the other thing that's really, really important in, in addition to other lipid studies is I always keep tabs on my apolipoprotein B. This is probably, it's arguable, but one of the most important markers uh, for atherosclerotic disease. And so, uh, yeah, I like definitely like to keep mine low, uh, under 90. 82 is not bad. Um, I guess I'd like to see it a little bit lower than that, but that's just me. Um, I'm a high achiever. <laughs> But 82 is not too bad. So anyway, make sure you get your apolipoprotein B checked. If you're one of my patients, we are checking it. Um, but if uh, your doctor is not checking that on you, ask them to add that to your next lipid panel. So, all right. I don't want to digress too much. But again, you know, these totally negative LH and FSH um, results are obviously a little bit disappointing. 
but they're not unexpected. I, I was expecting to see this. I honestly would have been a little bit surprised to see my LH and FSH levels at a detectable level. Um, so this wasn't a huge shock for me. But the point here is that undetectable LH and FSH levels are not going to keep you fertile if you're on TRT. You have to have you have to have LH and FSH, or you have to have some analog of that that sticks around long enough to continuously stimulate sperm production, okay? And up until now, I mean, that's been HCG. Now, sometimes you can add in like recombinant FSH, which I would do sometimes for some of the cases that were a little bit tougher uh, in terms of getting men fertile again. But really, H this is where HCG came in, um, and it, it did the job extremely well. Um, so. I, I don't recommend gonadorelin at this point, um, you know, unless I see, obviously this isn't a scientific study. This is an N of one of just me. Maybe I've got weird physiology, um, but I don't think so. I think I'm probably pretty normal. So um, if you are a man on testosterone and you cannot get HCG um, from Big Pharma, and your doc wants to put you on gonadorelin uh, in the hopes that you will maintain your fertility while on TRT, you know, I have my doubts about that. I, I honestly, I, I would never make that promise to a man because I really don't see this being sufficient to maintain adequate sperm counts. I could be wrong. There's not a ton of studies yet, okay? Uh, maybe just having these little pulses of LH and FSH after every injection is enough to just kind of keep enough sperm in the pipeline. I kind of doubt it. Um, I just, there's, there's no data on it. So, you know, what options do we have? Let's say you can't get HCG, gonadorelin doesn't work. I, I'm not aware of any good options at this point. Uh, I have heard of clinics using Clomid or Clomiphene or Enclomiphene in addition to TRT. Mechanistically, this doesn't make sense to me. Um, I don't think it's gonna work. Uh, maybe I'll do a podcast on that and kind of explain why. Um, now, Kispeptin, which is back up, you know, that's above GNRH on the HPTA axis. I think it has potential. Nobody knows how to dose this. Uh, the internet bros will tell you a lot of different things online, but there's no there's no good studies, um, at least at this point. But there's there's a glimmer of hope that maybe kispeptin um, uh, could restore fertility, assuming you've otherwise got a normal hypothalamus and a normal functioning pituitary gland, not to mention normal functioning testicles. So uh, if you don't, so if you're, you know, ex-military guy, maybe you've had a bunch of traumatic brain injuries from IED blasts. Okay. We used to see a lot of those guys. Uh, or you've had a lot of concussions uh, or you've had other, you know, brain trauma. You, you may not have a fully functioning pituitary gland or hypothalamus. And that might be the whole reason why you have low testosterone, in which case kispeptin, you know, may not work for you. Um, and, um, you know, even gonadorelin wouldn't work. Even if it, even if it did work, it wouldn't work on you. So, you know, right now guys, I, it, this really sucks. I, I, there's not great options out there. I, I can only hope that, um, you know, the FDA makes an exception for HCG, uh, because this is, um, this is a tragedy. It, um, it's going to affect millions of men, in the U.S., uh, it's going to really compromise their ability to uh, treat their hypogonadism uh, and all their low testosterone symptoms, and then still maintain fertility and, and have a family, uh, which is obviously super important to to a lot of men. Um, but ladies, it's also going to affect you because um, in the IVF or in vitro world, HCG does get used uh, quite a bit, and so costs are going to go up. And, um, you know, there's not a lot, a ton of money to be made by big pharma from HCG. So they don't have a huge incentive to just ramp up production. So it, it's going to be hard to get, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. And it's going to be quite expensive, which, which really is a shame. So, um, unfortunately it doesn't look like gonadorelin in my opinion. And just from what I've experienced is, is going to cut it. Um, if you guys have, um, if you've had different experiences with gonadorelin, uh, I would love to see if you have blood work showing detectable LH and FSH levels. That would be awesome. Please, uh, you know, hit me up in the comments. And um, you know, this I, this is this is an evolving area, and uh, you know, I'm open to learning more about it. But it, um, I, I just don't think it's going to be what what we all hoped uh, that it would be. So, wish you guys the best of luck, and um, I guess we'll just see how things turn out. All right, take care.
All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.